I am very happy to welcome uh, uh, Prabir Purkayastha, who is who's, who's a familiar face to many of us here. Uh, in fact, I was thinking, how should I introduce him? And, and I felt he wears so many hats that that itself is something. But what's actually interesting is how so many of his hats, from a very different angle, has something to do with freedom. And, and uh, uh, if it was not for the fact that he was actually leaving the country today for, for several weeks, he could have actually called him multiple times to talk about for different things, different issues, <laughs> different things to do with, with freedom. He's, he's an engineer by training. Uh, who specializes in uh, on issues related to energy policy, on telecom, on climate, on on he's been uh, very actively involved with the people science movement. He's he's been very actively involved with the free software movement on the larger issue of knowledge commons. So that's another sort of very important angle uh, on on freedom, uh, on which he's got uh, uh, very special. Uh, knowledge and, and uh, uh, things to say, but uh, given that we are going to get, get have only one occasion to call him, we thought there is this one very special reason to call him, uh, uh, and which was to get him to speak on what ha happened during emergency. Uh, Prabir was a first semester student when you're doing a PhD, doing a PhD? but yeah, you just joined. You just joined JNU. Uh, when emergency was clapped and uh, on 25th of September outside the School of Languages he was arrested uh, mistaken for JNUSU president and, and he spent all the, the entire period of emergency in the jail. So, so we'll uh, get to hear from him about emergency as seen from inside uh, more than as seen from outside. Uh, there is one special thing that I would want to mention that this October uh, uh, Modi ji decided to have a meeting to honor some people uh, who had sort of uh, could been arrested in emergency. Prabir was invited and he wrote a, wrote a letter refusing to participate because he said what you've done is as, as as bad as uh, 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 what emergency was like and unless you're willing to deal with this there's no point you have no right to celebrate uh, what happened during emergency so so and, and we are very happy that Prabir is here and and uh, we to hearing. first I must start by congratulating the students of JNU you know, when we think about JDU, we always think ours was the best time. We were the most politically active. And we did the best of everything. But when I really look at it objectively, I have to concede that you guys have really done far more than we actually did. So, so and the second thing, as Aisha is saying, that our time the faculties to be stayed, serious, never really came out except on one occasion during the emergency when they actually condemned my arrest. The only time Junta in the 19 or 21 months of emergency passed a resolution against what had happened. But you also have a very active, uh, vibrant uh, teachers association which has been quite active in this and I, it's the unity of the campus that has been the striking feature of what we are seeing and the maturity with which the students and the teachers have met the onslaught that is today on JNU and also in various parts and various other universities. The fact that the university has been chosen to be the focal point of the attack is also interesting because since I've been asked to speak about the emergency, and I'm going to correct what Vikas had said, a couple of things. So it is also true that at that point of time, the universities were also the focal point of attack because it was also clearly understood that that's where the resistance of the youth come from. They're in a place where they can meet, there is an exchange of ideas, and new thoughts, new uh, movements spring up from the universities and that's why the universities are always thought to be dangerous places for the establishment. So it's not surprising 
that they have identified the universities as the focus, focus of attack. That's what we are seeing today. I will come to the emergency part, but before I do that, I need to give a little background why the emergency took place, because it's also, uh, you know, something that needs to be thought about 40 years later, because it does seem that we are entering a certain kind of phase, which has certain similarities with what happened then, but also certain dissimilarities. So one should not think that history repeats itself. It is certain things which are common, certain things which are not common. The emergency was, in some sense, was also very interesting because Mrs. Gandhi had won a massive victory in 1971. Uh, the Garibi Hatao slogan uh, was such that it had really moved the country's electorate. And uh, she had, I think, more than 350 seats in the elections. It is a complete sweep that the Congress, uh, at that time it used to be called Congress I. After the election, it really started being the co called the real Congress because it was the electorate had decided that the Congress O and the Congress I was no longer valid, so it became really the, the, the Congress. Within three years of such a massive mandate, Mrs. Gandhi started losing the people. So there were student movements, uh, not a particularly good one, the Navadirman Samiti in Gujarat, which was an essentially an anti-reservation movement, which had sprung up. And then there was what was the call for total revolution by Jayaprakash Narayan, which had sections of the left, the sections of the right, and also the socialists, all a part of the larger gathering. And uh, Jayaprakash Narayan was talking about non-party movements. So there was this uh, call for non-party movements, but against the corruption of the government. In some sense, it is reminiscent of the Anna Hazare movement as well, because this non-party talk about only corruption, don't talk about fundamental issues, were also very much a part of this call for total revolution. 1974, we had what would be the railway strike. And JNU was also one of the places where there was a lot of, uh, shall we say, resistance. We, I remember that uh, the students, and I was, though I was uh, doing my master's uh, computer work in IIT Delhi, I came from Motila Nehru Engineering College in Ilava. So I used to hang around JNU because in those days the computers are not the ones that are there in your pocket or in the on your desk. There used to be big room in which there will be air conditioned room was only the only place that was air conditioned that time was the computer center and there would be uh, one big room with lots of cabinet which was the computer and you had perforated cards which you gave in and after seven days you got a printout saying what are the mistakes you had made. So this was what we had to do. So 99% of our master's thesis time if you are doing some computer work was spent in waiting for your printout. So I spent that time in JNU. I had friends there. I was a part of the Students' Federation of India. So in 74, we had the railway strike. And the railway strike was, in some sense, a watershed, because the working class movement also came out against Mrs. Gandhi. So this kind of rising movements, combined with what then was the verdict that came out that her election was not uh, proper, that there had been misuse of government machinery for the elections and so on, and she got disqualified uh, by the Allahabad High Court. At that point, she felt that there was a threat to her government, threat to herself, whatever the threat perception was, and she also felt that she had a right to rule which was being taken away, probably. So whatever it is, she declared emergency on June 25th, a whole bunch of people were taken to jail, and this, uh, all forms of formal democracy disappeared. That means you had uh, complete censorship in the newspapers, <coughs> students' union was actually derecognized, all the normal trappings which we had been accustomed to changed in a day. <laughs> now the interesting part was that they, it was largely, it was police action, police oppression that we were seeing. It was censorship, 
It was police action, putting people behind bars, stopping all formal protest. This was the characteristic of the emergency. And the university here, of course, fell in line very quickly. And students were, who were admitted by the normal process of selection, a set of the students' names were struck off the admission list. The key one at that time was Dev Prashad Tripathi, who was the president of the Students' Union at that time, with the SFI, who is now uh, unfortunately or fortunately, whatever one wants to say, in the National Congress Party of India, NCP, and he's the General Secretary. So DPT uh, was a Students' Union president. His name was also struck off. And then there was a Students' Union meeting in which uh, Ashok Lata Jain, who was the uh, students, uh, student counsellor for the student School of Social Sciences, she chaired the meeting because DPD's case was there, and the students' union issued a uh, protest against striking off the names. I think 11 students' names were struck off, including DPD's, after which she was expelled from the university. So the students at that time had also been organizing protests of different kinds. So we had what was in that, that those times used to be a, a broadsheet we used to bring out called the resistance. Uh, since cyclostyle, these were cyclostyling days, you didn't have Xerox machines and so on. So we had to cyclostyle and since you couldn't cyclostyle them outside in Beir Sarai, somewhat similar to what I believe you guys are also facing now. So we actually bought a small cyclostyling machine and we used to cyclostyle it ourselves and distribute it at night as a resistance. So we called for a three-day strike. On the second day of the strike, uh, the Tripathi, I, and Inrani, one of our friends, and a couple of others were standing there when Menika Gandhi came to, the, came to attend her, to her class. She was a student of the School of Languages. And then, of course, we told her there is a strike. The student has been expelled. You should go back. So she went back. Now, next, I'm reading the Shah Commission report, which exists on this. It seems she went back and complained to Sanjay Gandhi, who was de facto really running the country at that point of time. Mrs. Gandhi had sort of abdicated her role to being the figurehead, and Sanjay Gandhi was more or less calling the shots, certainly Delhi. So he, she went and complained to him that, look, you say there is an emergency. You say all this is happening. But I was not allowed to go to the campus. I was not allowed to go to my class. So Sanjay Gandhi called up Binder. And this is all in the Shah Commission report. Called up Binder and said, come and meet me. So he met him. So he fired him. What is this? Useless. You fellows, you know, JNU doing all this. My wife can't attend her class. <laughs> so Binder came. P.S. Binder was a DIG range, okay, and he was the key police person in Delhi at the time, who was also later on uh, involved in what is called Sundar Daku's murder. He actually killed him in cold blood, and he was indicted for this. And of course, finally it all got dropped because Mrs. Gandhi won the election, and then all these cases got dropped. But nobody raised the issue, was Sundar really a Daku or not? The only question was, was Sundar killed in cold blood by the police. The uh, Ishwar Jahan case, where people are now debating, was she elite or not? That was really not the issue. The issue was, was Sundar killed in cold blood, executed, what's an extrajudicial killing or not? So here is Bender who then comes in in a rather filmy style, in a black ambassador with policemen. I was still standing there. DPT had moved on. I was still standing there and grabs me, pulls me inside the, inside the car, there was a scuffle for about five minutes. I'm not very hefty, so I couldn't really resist for rather large-sized policemen, including Bender. So I was sort of whisked away. And then the fun, fun and game started because the DM apparently, the additional district magistrate P. Ghosh, who was responsible for signing the arrest warrant, he said, I really can't sign this warrant. You guys have nothing against him. How can I sign this warrant? How can I sign a visa warrant on that? So then it goes all the way to the what is called the divisional commissioner, Shushil Kumar. Then it goes to the lieutenant governor of Delhi, who was Kishan Chandar. Uh, and then the Kishan Chandar, and all this is recorded in the Shah Commission, Kishan Chandar and Divisional Commissioner and Binder, all three of them said the PM's house is involved, which means Manaka Gandhi, Sanjay Gandhi are involved, so we have to execute this warrant. He has to be put in under MISA. That's when I go under MISA. So 
Now, of course, P. Ghosh had one thing which he didn't disclose. It's quite interesting he didn't disclose this. He and Ashoka, who, on whose, uh, uh, Ashoka and I were engaged to be married. And we had given our notice for marriage uh, three weeks before this incident. And P. Ghosh recognized Ashoka because in the railway strike, all the stone throwing and all which we did, of course, only in retaliation for all this fire, all this uh, uh, shells that they were throwing at us, this uh, tear gas shells. So only in retaliation for that we threw some stones. So all that exchange that had taken place, so Ashoka and Ghosh had an exchange, a verbal exchange on this. So he remembered her and he talked about how JDU students are very militant and so on. So I think he had a some kind of a personal remorse about this that these people were getting married three you know just week after this and I'm going to sign his MISA warrant but it is not there anywhere. He met me recently we meet in some of this environmental uh, conferences and so on because he became the secretary department of environment so he very proudly tells others you know I put him I signed his MISA warrant I put him behind bars and I also married him because finally when we did get married we also still he was still the eight year so it was a civil marriage so we still got married in front of him and he came to my in fact that night for the dinner my father had invited him and he even presented with me a little booklet called prison prison notebooks of Regis Debris who would also at that time uh, if we had been in jail in Latin America during for going with Che Guevara for certain things so the interesting part of all this is that while we are sort of remembered as a people who sort of fought emergency, who were in jail and various things, as to be called every 10 years, 15th year, 5th year, 20th, 20th year, 25th year, after that it has stopped. Okay, remembering emergency. The interesting part is that we really were not the heroes of emergency because once we had been arrested, we were in a very free space. We were in jail. We could say whatever we wanted. We had no fear of anything. While the people outside were the ones who were the real heroes of the emergency because every day they had to continue their fight. How do you fight this emergency regime? So I think, you know, courage is a very peculiar issue. Who are, who's more courageous? The one who got arrested? <laughs> I mean, in my case, I can't even claim too much credit. I was kidnapped. So it wasn't that I was doing anything great except stopping Menaka Gandhi, which others would have also done. So here I was sort of recognized for a long time in JNU afterwards. My peers would still remember my emergency days and so on. But the ones who distribute every, at every night would distribute the leaflets in the various rooms, the ones who organized during emergency, who organized the, the resistance that took place in Jane, which continued for a long time. In fact, uh, I think once uh, somebody, a senior functionary of the government came, I, I don't know who it was, the students all sat in the front chairs, the minute he started speaking, all of them left. So different forms of protest went on throughout the period of emergency. So I think the real heroes of emergency were the students who fought every day for what was going to happen. So, you know, in that sense, the distinction between the normal time and times which are in some sense abnormal is that abnormal times call for heroism. Normal times, you do what you think is right, and there is no threat to you. So we seem to be entering again abnormal times. Abnormal times in which what you think, what you say, what you wear, what is all under threat of different kinds. What we have today, which is different from emergency, to the police action, the vice chancellor's action, all this is not that different. What is different today is that you also have the physical violence that today has been unleashed by the AVVP uh, and various forms of the uh, RSS, the various organizations of the RSS, in which today any faculty of JNU goes to speak, speak anywhere, the meetings are being attacked. If the JDU name is used in a meeting, those meetings are being attacked. We went to speak in Uzafarpur in Bihar, two hours from Patna. And there are 200 lati welding stone-throwing mob they had gathered to attack the meeting. 
So this is the difference that you see, that you have not only a government which is willing to attack civil liberties in different forms, but also an attack accompanied by really uh, the, what shall we say, local goons at different places who will decide now what is permissible and what is not permissible. What is nationalism? What is not nationalism? What is uh, Bharat Mata is the only test of nationalism or, or whatever test of nationalism they will create. And there is the other part of it, which is that in all this, their attempt is to always find divisive issues. The issue is not to find symbols which unite people. The issue is to find symbols which will divide the people so that you can vilify one section. You can say these are the people who should be put outside the pale of India. They do not belong here. So the attempt is whether it is Bharat Mata, whatever it is, whichever the slogans, whatever the issues are, it is to create consciously divisive slogans to divide the people. And I think that is the combination of government patronage and physical violence, the combination of these two is the change. This is the threat that we see for the nation. I think what has been happening in JDU has brought at least a recognition to a lot of sections that we are entering certain difficult times and we need to think about what to do. It has united a very broad set of people. I must say that the kind of sections who have come together on this are, I will say, from liberal to left. There has been a broad unity that this kind of things is not what we stand for. This is not the India we want. How we can enlarge it is really what today is a challenge for all of us. And you as JNU, as people who have played a very important role historically, not that you chose this role, it was actually been thrust upon you, but you have stood the test well. So the fact that you have chosen to stand up to it as students, as teachers, I think you will carry this responsibility of how to take this struggle far forward, how to take this resistance forward, and how in the future it can take a broad resistance against what this regime, the Modi government is doing. I've only, I'll end with only a sh small uh, comment on what I think is happening. I think I do not remember a, any government losing its popularity uh, so quickly as the Modi government seems to have done. And having done that, I think that one of the reasons that chose nationalism as the platform on which to attack others is something they were reserving for nearer the election. I think they've shot their arrow too fast, too quickly. And I do believe that this is not sustainable for too long. So question is, how do we shape up to it? How do we build our, retain our unity? How we can build a broader unity against this attack? This is a real challenge. It's a challenge for you, for all of us who are outside, and I think for the country as a whole. Questions? Well, I'm not going to be an economist because you're much better ones on the campus than me. So I will just give you a quick business answer to the question that it is true that has helped in terms of the uh, taxes because they have actually not reduced the price of oil and taxed the difference. That's really what they have done. And they have increased the price of uh, oil very recently again. But you must see one thing. Our industrial production has actually fallen. The agricultural crisis is very deep at the moment. Inflation for food grains, what 
Kanhaya called Har Har Modi to Ar Har Modi is very much here. So there is no doubt that there is a financial crisis in terms of jobs, in terms of the farmers. This crisis continues. And that's what is leading to, to a large section, that is what is leading to disaffection. So one of the issues is that you may be able to invest in infrastructure, which is good, of course it needs to be done. You may be able to help the business interest, which is what is doing, but in terms of the people, in terms of either employment generation, which is a huge issue, and agriculture, these are the two areas which is electorally sensitive for them, and therefore the problem, I think, is not going to solve this also quickly. But as I said, you have much better economists in the campus than I have, including the one standing here, so I'm not going to comment further. <laughs> Thank you, Prabir. I have a question to ask. Uh, why don't you say something about the role of RSS during that period? That's, that's one thing that you have not touched, and I think that's an important, important aspect. I was uh, sort of ducking this for a different reason. Uh, it might appear that I'm being very mean to them. Okay, <laughs> so <laughs> I was sort of not wanting to do that. But since you've asked the question, a the RSS, which, for instance, was also jailed after the assassination of Mahatma Gandhi, it was a very different kind of RSS than we met in jail. We had heard at the time they were very committed, they were really, uh, you know, they believed in what they said and they didn't really uh, relige on their commitments inside jail. What we found inside jail was a pining how to get out, okay, and uh, various letters were being written. As you know, Balasab Dehru said, Dehru said these two letters where he wrote to Mrs. Gandhi saying, uh, I accept the 20-point program, you're doing a good thing, and so on. We'd like to meet you, and wanted somehow to really have a reconciliation. And Mrs. Gandhi at that time did not respond. I have very personal recollections of this which I have to share. I was, uh, I was one of the very few people who got relief during emergency through a court order. Uh, I, I had also filed for behavior spoke corpus petition, uh, like many others did. So I was, uh, I had to appear for my master's viva. So the court allowed that I be taken, I not allowed, ordered that I be taken to Allahabad for my viva. So I was taken under handcuffs. It's quite dramatic. I was taken under handcuffs with 10, 12 policemen guarding me. And this is the only time I've got full bar berth in an unreserved compartment. The minute they got up onto the compartment, everybody left the compartment. <laughs> Dangerous criminal guarded by so many gunmen. So anyway, so I, I, Nanaji Deshmukh was in the same ward as I was. So he had told me, talk to Gurli Manoharji. We were quite pally in jail. You know? It was a small uh, ward of only 30, 35 people. So we were all very friendly. Arun Jaitli was also in the same ward. So uh, he put on a lot of weight during jail. It's only after his bariatric surgery he has lost some of that. So anyway, so we, uh, I, I was told to talk to Gurli Manohar Joshi and find out what his views are. So this is cold winter night. And Naini Jail is a huge jail. This is one of the advantages of the colonial jails is they have huge space. So uh, we, he took me around that whole compound. We walked for about an hour. And his constant refrain was, Ki buddhimani ka kaam to yehi hai. Ki kisi bhi tarah. And he repeated, kisi bhi tarah. Yahan se nikla jai. <laughs> so he also, after that, we, I came into the ward and there were other RSS people over there. So another section of them met me and said, look, un, unki vichar hai, hamari vichar nahi hai. They spoke much better Hindi than I do. So unki vichar hai, hamari vichar nahi hai. So I said, theek hai. So I conveyed this sentiment of Unli ji to Nanaji Deshmukh. So he heaved a deep sigh of relief and said, oh, aurat maane tab na. So, <laughs> so, so I wasn't aware of the letters of Balasad Deoras. So I later on understood why he had the deep sigh and why he said what he did. So a section of the RSS had really was very willing to compromise and get out somehow or the other. But Mrs. Gandhi had a problem that having declared emergency and having declared is a fascist threat to the country. 
there wasn't much that she could do to reconcile with her. And honestly, I asked Pia Naksa this question, that why did she go in for elections? Because actually, if she had continued for another two, three, four years, she might have got away with it because honestly, the resistance of the ground was building up, but there is no political resistance physically left except in campuses like JNU or other places. The physical activity, political activity, uh, had really in that sense come to somewhat of a halt. So she said, you know, he said that this is because in South she did win a huge by huge numbers. She did. South she swept at that point. So a section of the Congress party believed the emergency was good for them and they would sweep the elections. And she, since like Modi, she has also the predilection, she cannot listen to any criticism. So only gets the thing she wants to hear. Same, same thing Mr. Uh, Modi also seems to have. So I think that she got therefore the belief that the emergency, if she lifted and had an election, she would win. And it would be affirmation of what she had done. And she was badly mistaken as she discovered later. One thing I must say, though this is not the question you asked, which I should have covered anyway, that you know, before emergency, the Indian middle class was quite willing for an authoritarian regime. They quite often would say, we need a benevolent dictatorship. All this democracy is bogus. And when the emergency was declared, they actually said, very good, you know, now we'll get discipline. But discipline, they meant, of course, they would be indisciplined, but everybody else would be disciplined. Mm -hmm. So therefore, they really meant the workers would be disciplined. They were really not right, you know, we need to discipline them. But when they found that the policeman, one lowly constable with a danda, was more powerful than the middle class Babu, then they turned and they realized that actually the so-called electoral democracy, which we for a long time took for granted, had a value and protected us in different ways, which an authoritarian regime did not do. And this was put in very simple terms by a peasant uh, activist when he said, you know, emergency may jo hamara daroga ake hamara jo panchayat ka leader hai, usko marta hai, tab hume samaj mein aaya hai ki, you know, ki ye sahi nahi. So the power of the vote that once in five years you can throw out your leaders is a big power, is something they realized after the, during the emergency. And that's why for 25, 30 years, you didn't hear about this thing about how we need an authoritarian strong leader. Till now, the generation which has forgotten it, now we have a generation which never saw all this. So you have a new generation and therefore you have again this opinion, we need a strong leader, we don't want dissent, we need growth, and therefore all these dissenting voices should be controlled strongly. And that also explains why you have the Modi phenomena today. Campuses in India uh, is uh, really uh, burning. Like everyone, in different campuses uh, are coming out of uh, their classes. Are uh, like they are in problem and like they are speaking uh, against it. So uh, uh, and there is a uh, like kind of uh, student movement uh, in all over India in different campuses. But what I see, if I compare it to uh, student movements in different countries, which has uh, taken place in recent, uh, uh, recently, like in Chile, there was a student movement from 2011 to 2013. And uh, in that movement, like, uh, hundreds of thousands of students like came out uh, on the street and it went for two years, for whole two years. It was uh, about uh, against the privatization of education and accessibility of education to everyone. So, uh, sir, I want to ask you, like in India also, you, you, you must have seen different kind of a student movement in, uh, like uh, from the time you have, like you have, in all of your time, you must have seen different student movements. So, what is the difference you see in uh, different student movement in India, which has taken place uh, as far as your knowledge and what, and the difference uh, uh, of the student movement which is happening now with respect to uh, student movement like happened in uh, other places in the world like Chile. 
and what is the potentiality uh, of this movement which is happening uh, right now in India? Crystal ball is a difficult exercise, how to predict the future. But a uh, quick answer, you know, we responded also to international events at that time. In fact, campuses all over the world were really burning at the end of the 1960s. You had 68, what is famously called the Paris Revolt of the Students. But everywhere, the campuses were alive. In the United States, it was draft, which was the military issue, drafting students into the military and sending them to Vietnam. In the case of other parts of the world, they were also radicalizing influence of the Vietnam War itself. So for a lot of us, in fact, in my case, I remember uh, used to see every day Vietnam on the front page of the papers. And I, would, I went to the library. I was one of those studious guys who used to read, uh, you know, uh, so spend a lot of time reading stuff. This disadvantage of having glasses very early in life. So I used to go and read all the books on Vietnam that I could get in the National Library. My house was just next to it. So then that was the radicalizing influence we have, which brought a lot of us onto the streets. So part of it is not the student movement alone, but the larger movement that is there in society. And the students, the working class movements together, really created the N60s phenomena. India extends a little more because of the emergency. It goes on to, so I would say, uh, mid-70s or even N70s. You get a student movement, which is very vibrant. All over the world, we saw a down downslide after that. So you really don't get that kind of student movement again. We are seeing some of it pick up again. What it will do in the future, we don't know. But it's clear, the students reflect the ferment that is there in society. And they are, the, in some sense, the advance guard of change. So a lot of what's going to happen is something that we have to look up now to you for what is that the future that you are going to create. Because we can only give advice now, sit here, give a few bashits, but you really have to create the future. That's true for you know what you have to do. So I don't think you can take help from the past. You really have to craft your own future. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Prabhi, for this very, very vivid and, and uh, very, very vivid description of what emergency was like, particularly through your own personal experiences. I have to share one, one little thing. Uh, I'd heard a very little, a small part of this and read uh, a little bit of this. Uh, there's a sh short piece at, on Bodhi Commons uh, on, on uh, Prabhi's arrest. And I have to say, you know, when on the 11th, uh, the 12th, Kanaya was arrested, you know, there's sudden sort of comparisons made between what happened in JNU at the time of emergency and how, you know, this was really sort of, uh, you know, coming back of what had happened during emergency and how it was perhaps worse and, and so on. Uh, that little piece on Bodhi Commons has has a photograph of Probeers. And it's really like, you know, you've been transported 40 years <laughs> behind. So, 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 I mean, uh, I think that's, that's another sense in which students of today are very similar for what Probeer and his comrades must have been 30 years, 40 years ago. 40 years, 40 years ago. So, so uh, for that, thank you very much.